today, are you ready for some heart surgery? (laughs) The difference being, however, that with Monday Night Football, you were an observer. I don't want you to be an observer this morning. I want you to participate to get serious about getting your heart aligned with God's heart for divine acceleration. To be gut level, honest with yourself so that you can be free from anything that hinders you from letting God show you what, how he wants you to step into his divine acceleration. Last night, you were given an invitation by Dr. Frank to step into divine acceleration. This invitation is not just for pastors. It's for leaders. It's for the church. And we are all the church. Dr. Frank invites us into this unstoppable forward motion with God. I think that's just a powerful statement. Unstoppable forward motion with God. He said that divine acceleration is the potential for a greater increase and influence of God's kingdom in our world through powerful supernatural surges of his Holy Spirit. He told us that God desires for something supernatural to happen in the church. Well, if you know me at all, you know that heart issues are very important to me because the issue isn't the issue. Come on. The issue, the issue is the heart. The issue is the heart. Yeah. The word heart is mentioned in the New King James Version of the Bible 927 times. So the, so the word heart is important to God, too. What happens in our heart is important to God. Here's one time that heart is mentioned. When Samuel was checking out Jesse's sons, looking for a man to anoint as king, he picked out the best-looking son. But the Lord said to Samuel in 1 Samuel 16, 7, Do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Here's another verse. Proverbs 27, 19. As in water, face reflects face. So a man's heart reveals the man. So a woman's heart reveals the woman. Listen to David's prayer in Psalm 1912. Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from secret faults. David knew that it is possible for us to hide things in our heart. What's hidden in your heart? I'm reading through the Bible with my church this year, and in the early part of April, the Bible Project reading plan had me in Kings. I came across this scripture that made me stop and take notice. King Solomon is dedicating the newly built temple to God. And in his powerful prayer in 1 Kings 8.38, he says this, Whatever prayer, whatever supplication is made by anyone or by all your people Israel, when each one knows the plague in his own heart and spreads out his hands, Towards the temple. Some versions use the word affliction in place of plague. But for my teaching this morning, I think the word affliction 
is a euphemism for plague. Consider the plagues of Egypt. They were deadly. Do you know the plague in your own heart? What in your heart kills the vision of God for your church, for your life? Well, after this most excruciating heart probe, King Solomon now gives us a directive to stretch out our hands towards the temple. This is a position of surrender, of submission, and of saying, I'm letting go of whatever I've found hidden in my heart. You should all have a handout. Um, If you don't, we'll have someone. If you don't have a handout, will you raise your hand? And Jeremy, if you could help me again, please. This will kind of, we'll just take a little second here and so people can get settled and. Thanks. Anyone else need a handout? Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Okay. You will see on this handout, there are two, uh, two lists. This is a really short list with heart descriptives that are straight from the word. These are not words that I made up. I pulled them out of scripture. And you can thank me that it's a short list and not the 927 times that that heart was listed in the New King James Version. As you look at the handout, you'll see two columns. One is for an unsurrendered heart and one for a surrendered heart. The two lists are loosely cross-matched, some of them uh, closely matched, some not. So I would like you to read through the unsurrendered list. Numb heart, uncircumcised, obstinate, arrogant, prideful, deceived, discouraged, faint-hearted, trembling, stubborn, sad, heart, perverted, crooked, heavy, deceitful, rebellious, haughty, sojourner, deluded, double-minded, heart neglects the poor, a foolish heart, a heart not wholly true to the Lord. Is your heart mentioned there? If so, what will you do about it? And if not, do you have a heart issue that I can add to my list? (laughs) I mentioned earlier that we need to get gut level honest with ourselves if we are to allow God to touch those areas in our heart that hinder what he wants to do in our lives. Are you willing to let God touch those areas? Keep in mind that God never exposes hidden faults in us to shame us, never to shame us, only to heal, to redeem, to restore. Okay? Now let's look at the surrendered list. Serving, penitent, upright, blameless, trusting, glad, courageous, willing, contrite, rejoicing, kind, pure, integrity of heart, joyful, grace-giving, faithful, humble, steadfast, wise of heart, singleness of heart, heart wholly true to the Lord. If I were to ask you to circle the heart descriptives on the surrendered list, How many would you be able to circle? Is your heart unsurrendered or 
surrendered. A surrendered heart means you are giving up self-rule and giving God total control over your life in complete trust, in complete trust. It's not just a, hmm, whatever, God, whatever you want to do. It's, oh, God, whatever, whatever you want to do, my heart is yours. My heart is yours. You know. We can't grunt out a heart change. It has to be a work of God. It has to be a work of God. And he will work through a surrendered heart. Let me ask you some probing questions. What happens in your heart when you are in the middle of a time-sensitive project and someone calls with a pressing need? What happens in your heart when you get an email from a congregant that tells you how bad your sermon really was? What happens in your heart when your close friend calls with an excuse as to why she can't go out to dinner with you that evening as planned, only to find out that she went out to dinner with someone else? What happens in your heart when you feel like you're overworked and nobody cares? What happens in your heart when you have worked incredibly hard on a project and someone else gets the credit? Favorite saying of mine, there is no end to what you can accomplish if you don't care who gets the credit. Most of us are so used to our own personalities that we don't even recognize that we have behaviors and, and attitudes that can be harmful or discouraging or difficult for other people. You can move my stuff right there on the floor and sit. Yeah, that's mine. You're welcome. I try to be. All right, I'm going to go back on that just a little bit. Most of us are so used to our own personalities that we don't even recognize we have attitudes and behaviors that might bring discomfort or harm to those around us. You know? Have you ever had someone sting you with their words? Someone you love? You know? Have you... Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I can think of a time. I can think of a time. You know, Scripture tells us that we either speak life or death with our words. What are your words speaking? What are your words speaking? Out of the abundance of our heart, our mouth speaks. You know? I once had a client tell me that he didn't need to change. I mean, this was the way God created him. It was how he responds to life. It's how he made me. Hmm, I said, God, God created you angry? I don't think so. I think the rage that you carry in your heart is something you added to his original divine creation. You know? I told him, you can continue to defend your deep-seated rage. And you can continue killing people with your words. Or you can surrender your anger to the healing touch of God and allow his Holy Spirit, his peaceable spirit, to come and permeate every area of your being. 
I'm happy to report that he chose healing. Yeah. Healing is our choice. Healing is our choice. Oh, not that day. He, he didn't choose healing that day. It took many weeks of intense counseling for him to get to a place where he would trust me and trust God with his heart and surrender. Yeah. Recently, a Christian friend that I've known since the 1980s posted a scathing article on Facebook against the church and the many areas in which the church is negligent and unloving. Well, <laughs> I love the church. I love the church. And, and so I responded with my strong defense, and I told her that what she described may happen in some churches, but it does not happen in all churches. And I said, when you write the church, you are insinuating all churches. And I told her that I took offense at her blanket statement against the church. Her response back to me, if you are offended, it's on you. She deflected everything back on me. Do you do that when you're caught with some unseemly heart issue? Do you make the other person, do you make it their fault? Yeah. In other words, if you're offended by my behavior, that's on you. Well, here's the thing. If you can make the other person the problem, then the blame you place on them for making you feel a certain way exonerates you from having to look at your own heart. You can feel good about where you are because really, you're not the problem. It's her. It's him. It's them. No, 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 no. It's your heart issue because the issue isn't the issue. The issue is the heart. One afternoon, I was playing a game of solitaire on my tablet, not even thinking about heart issues, when the word recalcitrant dropped in my mind. It came so strongly and so unexpectedly that I knew I needed to pay attention. I looked up the word in the dictionary, and after reading the def definition, I decided that it was a word that I need to share uh, with my time with you this morning. Recalcitrant, what does it mean? Stubbornly disobedient, resistant to authority, not responsive to treatment or correction, obstinately defiant of, difficult to manage or operate. Like words are grouchy, fractious, stubborn, rebellious, unruly, wayward, contrary, defiant, insubmissive, resistant, willful, mulish. <laughs> don't be stubborn like a horse or a mule without understanding. Oh, Lord, I don't want to be a mule. <laughs> I don't want to be a mule. No. Words that are the antonyms of recalcitrant, Agreeable, compliant, manageable, obedient, yielding, submissive. You may be thinking that recalcitrant is too strong of a word and doesn't apply to your heart issue. Perhaps you have substituted a more gentle word, a euphemism to the issue of your heart. I ask in the beginning if you were ready for some heart surgery. Heart surgery is painful, and if you squirm under the knife, disastrous. <laughs> Divine acceleration, a path set before you by the apostolic leadership team of MFI. Are you open to this invitation from your leaders? Do you trust them to hear from God and to speak for him? Or do you just give them a cursory glance and continue 
on your own path? Do you have an unsurrendered, recalcitrant heart? Some of you may be wondering, how can this sweet little dear great-grandmother be so brutal? (laughs) Talking about plagues in the heart, recalcitrant heart, killing people with our words. Brutal indeed. But it's because I love you all so dearly. I love you all so dearly. And I don't want there to be anything in your heart that hinders what God wants to do in your ministry, in your life, in your church. If God tells you that he wants to Cut something out of your heart. Don't resist him. Let him do it. Here's my final probing question before I turn the microphone microphone over to Jenna. Ask yourself, how does God want me to set the stage in my heart for his work, for his divine acceleration. So good. So we have a few minutes. I'm going to give Miss Shirley for um, some Q&A times. One of the things I... Yeah. No, just... Okay, I thought... Do you want to wait till the end? this is great. Okay. Fine, fine, fine. I just read the script. I just do what I'm told, Miss Shirley. Okay. Thank you. Good, good. You know, one of the things I find on this list is, oh, I've I've gotten freedom from that. And then I'm in the surrendered side. And then I'll go back to the unsurrendered side. And I play this ping pong game in my life and in my heart of, oh, I'm doing really good. I have freedom from this thing. And, oh, why does that upset me so much now? Oh, I thought I was surrendered. Oftentimes, I ask Miss Shirley when I'm having tea on her porch, is, I thought I was over this already. Mm-hmm. And the enemy comes back in and, and sneakily kind of plays it again. And, oh, that's maybe not healed all of the way. Mm-hmm. Let's try again. So don't lose heart. Right. Stay surrendered. Continue to surrender. Um, let's answer a few questions. Um, I have some here. But let's take maybe one from the crowd, if anyone has one right away. No? All right, Ms. Shirley, I have a question. How do we examine the intents and purposes of our heart? Okay. We have three very specific sources (laughs) that help us examine our hearts. Yeah. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. When the Holy Spirit points out or exposes an issue in, in our heart, he's always right on point. You, you don't have to question his accuracy. Okay? So then it's our responsibility to respond to what was exposed by repentance and humbly asking for help. Help me with that. Help me with that. Then we have the word of God. The word is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And um, I read once in a book by the late Dr. Larry Crabb in his book Inside Out that says, something is wrong when a two-edged sword glances off our skin or our heart without even drawing blood. So... If the word of God pricks your heart and you're not bleeding, I'm sorry, you have a stony heart. Yeah, you need to look at that. You need to look at that. Yeah. And then the people of God, the people of God. If you are really, really, really courageous, ask your spouse, do I have a heart issue? And then be brave enough, <laughs> be, be brave enough to respond without deflecting it back on them, you know. 
Yeah, yeah. Ask your children. Ask your neighbors. Ask people that you hang out with. Do I have a heart issue? It takes courage to say, oh, okay, okay, ooh, all right. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that with me. <laughs> The Spirit of God, the Word of God, the people of God. Really, really, really good sources for helping you discover what's in your heart that holds you back, that hinders you from doing all that God has purposed for you. you know? Wow. There's nothing more painful than a three-year-old telling you what they think sometimes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. now what? Uh, now that I've identified the issue in my heart, uh, what do I do with it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Surrender. Surrender. Surrender the issue to the Lord. I'm going to tell you, uh, I'll give you a little illustration about some heart surgery that took place in my own life. I was thrown... Uh, unexpectedly and cruelly into the single world in 1978. And at that time, I told the Lord, okay, I only want to be married again if I can serve you better married than I can single. And so fast forward 12 years, now a friendship has developed into romance, and I'm thinking that now I'm going to be married, and we're going to be a team and serve the Lord together. Yeah. And so I'm on my face in my living room one morning, just spending time with the Lord, seeking him, praising him, and he tells me that he wants to cut that relationship out of my heart. Whew. Okay. Uh, I, I have learned a long time ago that I'm not going to win if I argue with him. And, and so I surrendered that. I thought about all of the plans that I had conjured up in my own mind that now this teen ministry is what's well, not going to be a teen ministry. And so from my, from my face, I rolled over on my back, I laid my hands out, and I said, do it. <laughs> and he did. Mm -hmm. And he did. And here I am, 30 years later, <laughs> you know, single, serving the Lord with my whole heart. Do I, do I wish anything? No, no, because he cut it out, because I let him, and I did not squirm under the knife. You know, I did not squirm under the knife. If he shows you something in your heart that he wants to cut out, oh, let him, let him. Let him. Wow. Any more questions? No? All right. One of the things I always tell my girls, if we have to go to the doctor, get stitches or a Band-Aid, it's okay to cry, but you can't wiggle. Wiggling and fighting only makes it harder. It's going to take longer, and it's going to be more painful. Mm -hmm. So what, a, what an example that you shared with us surely truly is an amazing example of how to deal with issues of the heart. Can we give her a hand as she makes her way off the stage? Wow. Thank you, Miss Shirley. All right, as they get reset, um, 
If, if anybody can make some room, there's a few people on the floor. If there's an empty seat around you, could you just make some room for, for those people? Um, I'm going to get started. Next, we have the hippies. Are you guys going to go separate from each other? Are you guys going to go to get? Okay. You're going to, you got this. Yes. Okay. <laughs> the hippies serve as lead pastors of City Central Church and directors of Freedom Ministry in Tacoma, Washington. They are deeply committed to seeing the bride of Christ empowered and restored. They are passionate about training, equipping, and restoring the saints for the works of the ministry in preparation for the Lord's return. Um, Dr. Chris, this is it. I like that I get to say Dr. Chris is also the professor of systematic theology and biblical studies at Faith International University. The hippies reside in Tacoma with their four children. They are amazing examples. Amazing example. So lean in, extract something from them, and let's give her a hand. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't know how you follow that testimony of Shirley. <laughs> You're like, roll over on my back and say, do it. Woo. Um, Chris calls Shirley the velvet hammer because she's so soft and gentle, and yet the hammer and conviction of the Holy Spirit is so real. Um, when we receive this invitation to share, um, you know, we, this, our whole heart is how do we posture ourselves for this divine acceleration, right? How do we posture ourselves? How do we become those people that Bill talked about that are devout, right? And when I think about dev divine acceleration, I think about the wind blowing. And the Lord really took me to, like, for divine acceleration to stand, there has to be authentic leadership, and what are the priorities of one that is an authentic leader that will stand and not crumble? All of us are in this with our whole lives. We love Jesus. We love the church. But it's like what Chris was talking about, that busyness can keep us out of alignment with our priorities, right? Um, my son is home from college, and he's about to do a road trip with his car, okay? I don't know what year is it, a 2013 Jeep Commander? Anyway, it was parked for a long time, and we restored it, but we took it to the mechanic because we want it to be prepared for a long drive. So if we are preparing for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit that is going to be, that's going to fill our time, I think my heart is to come before you with a cup of, with some categories of questions to making sure some of you have exegetically preached the passages of scripture that I'm going to share. But I think, I guess I'm asking you to come, and I, you know the passage more than I do, but I'm asking you to come with a humble heart and just assess what's the condition of my heart. How am I doing living these priorities? So I'm going to start with Matthew 7, 24 through 27. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. I really believe that um, many of us, we've seen the spirit be pour out on men and women. But it's because they didn't have their foundation secure, their priorities weren't in line, the fallout was greater than the filling, right? We want to be those that can withstand the filling. I cannot tell you how passionate I am about what I'm about to share. Chris and I got married. He was raised in a Christian family, a Lutheran family, kind of like Bill spoke of. You know, didn't become a believer until he was in college. I was not raised in a Christian family. I was raised in like a mobile home where my family did drugs. There was all kinds of abuse. It was a hot mess, right? But God restored me and healed me. And I can't tell you, I love the bride of Christ. I can't talk about the church and the bride without crying. It is truly my family. Like my church is my family. They've healed me. They've restored me. They've loved me. And it's my privilege to do the same, right? So when I talk about these priorities, it's because I'm passionate that when, you know, this is talking about a storm, but we're talking about the blowing of the Holy Spirit. But either one can crash your house. 
right? So I just want us to make sure that we're like, I want you to listen to some of these questions and go, when was the last time I did this? So Mark 12, 30 says, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. There is no shortcut. We must take time and make the priorities of the kingdom the priorities of our heart. And he cares about your heart. He loves that you're a pastor and that you're a minister, but he cares about you. You are his son. You are his daughter. So when's the last time you, went, you just spent time worshiping the Lord? Not to prepare a sermon, not to um, just prepare for something, but just to worship him. When's the last time you read the word just to be with him? Not to prepare for a message or discipleship, but just to read the word. It's easy to get busy, right? Because it's like, and I, you know, Sunday's coming. And when's, what, maybe it's Wednesday's coming, the class is coming, the discipleship is coming, right? So, but we can get caught off guard and we're using the word of God, you know, like to, for those purposes, but not to, for him to speak to us personally, to convict us, to wash us, to cleanse us, to restore us, to renew us, right? He wants to renew and heal us, not just for us to use it as a tool to prepare for a message, right? When's the last time you went on a prayer walk just to talk and listen to him? Not to contend for your city or region, but to walk with your dad, And so, like, on one of those, I just think, if you can go, you know what, I don't remember the last time I went on a prayer walk, or I don't know if I've ever just been on a prayer walk to go, God, what what do you want to say to me? What's on your heart? Not for what are the plans and purposes for the church, but what's on your heart? I just want to encourage you, like, if one of those questions you're like, man, I don't know, just pause and get realigned, right? Right? Most of us know what our priorities are. It's living them, right? Amen? It's like, am I living them? So it's good to wash ourselves with questions that bring us into alignment with living our priorities. And the second, this one would be for those of you that are married. Because there's a, there's, we do this as a team, right? And so I'm going to read Ephesians 5, 25 through 33. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Notice, he wants us to love the church, <laughs> but do you notice he says husbands, so pastors that are husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. And I want you to think about that. Jesus is going to do that for the church, but I think a lot of us as pastors are, trying, are getting in his shoes to do it. And we need to be loving our wives as Jesus loved the church. Let Jesus take care of the church. You take care of your wife. There's not a more powerful testimony than, a, like, you know, when you see the pastor and his wife is distraught or whatever level of ministry or even just you're, you go to church and you see a couple that professes Christ but you can tell there's bitterness and bondage and separation. Can you see where your testimony breaks down? Your witness breaks down, right? So sometimes if I think if us, like if men, we're like, I'm going to let God do the thing with the church and I'm just going to love her well. I'm going to love her like Jesus is going to love the church. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. Who, he who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Right? So... In terms of your marriage, here's some of my invasive questions. <laughs> I care. I care. I care that we reflect Jesus and the church. I care that we reflect with brilliance and love and kindness and generosity and peace and joy. 
Right? I'm sorry. I think people, like, you have, if, like, you, the one for the, in con- what was that word? I didn't even know how to spell that. Yes, that word. That word. One of the synonyms was grouchy. You know, if somebody saw you on a Sunday drive with your wife, or maybe not Sunday, Saturday drive with your spouse, they'd be like, oh, they look inconstant. <laughs> or they look joyful, like they legitimately have joy. I know, I can't say it. I'm going to have to look it up and spell it and all the things. Incalcitrant, okay, all right. Anyway, so here's the question. Is when's the last time you invested in your marriage? Right? Chris and I, we teach marriage stuff. And I remember we were like, I was like, when's the last time we? We got to do one of these because I care about functioning integrity. We got to go to a conference. We can't act like we know everything. We need to go learn and receive. Right? So when's the last time you invested in your marriage? If you're reading all books about the church and you haven't read a book about marriage, you got to check yourself. Right? Like, and if you're bored, well, maybe that's why you stop being a learner. Right? So um, when's, the last, when's the last time you went to a conference or married, yeah, I read a marriage book together? You know, we, were, we taught a marriage conference a couple weeks ago, and we were talking about devotionals. And um, I said to the ladies, I go, man, you know, because we were talking about his needs and her needs. I was like, if you bought a devotional that was about how to... Um, make your sex life better, I bet your husband would be all over it. And they were like, they all laughed. But there's some, I'm so thankful I don't have to write those books. Praise his holy name. But I'm just saying, like, when's the last time you invested in your marriage? Read a book. Listen to a podcast. Go on a date. Right? So, listen, if, you, if you're like, we haven't gone on a date in two months like your number one assignment from this whole conference and all the amazing speakers that you're going to receive from is make, like don't leave this session without scheduling your next date. It's the best thing for your kids too. Just FYI. Okay. Last thing. <laughs> We've got the like, next thing. <laughs> and, you know, um, I'm so thankful. I, I'm just going to talk about us and family. And as pastors leading families, um, we were mentored by a couple. And I remember, um, I think our oldest was six months. And she said, you've got to remember, and I share this with you. This is her wisdom, not mine. In church, people come and people go. But your kids are always your kids. Right? And so it's so important that we give ear and love them. At the same time, I'm, you know, sometimes I am. I hope I don't offend somebody, but if I do, well, please, except I don't want to write myself off, right? But, you know, I, like, I know there's those people that are like, my baby's got to be to bed at 7 p.m. every night, and I'm like, oh, you know, like, so it's this dance, right, of loving our kids, but still extending the kingdom so they don't become self-centered, self-focused kids, right? We want them to know that we're a family about the kingdom, but we care about them. It's it's real. So I, I, I mean, you know, I, when this, the mom is like, my kids have to be to bed at seven every night. If there's a mom that I can tell is kind of like teachable, I'm like, they don't, you know, <laughs> I was like, not about her, but about this one's kids. I'm like, if they're, if they're in bed at nine o'clock, two nights, it's not going to kill them or you. Right. So that's, I'm sorry. If you're one of those moms in the sleep training, you're super offended. Ask God. For you, I could be wrong, and come correct me afterwards, and I will say thank you. I will say thank you for correcting me. When's the last time you spontaneously called your kids to tell them that you love them and that you're proud of them? Right? When's the last time you just shot them a text, like, with three things you love about them? They need to hear it. Man, our kids, they have a lot of pressure that we don't even realize that they're under. They need to hear words of affirmation from us, building them up. Not about, like, what they're doing in the church, but about who they are. Make that a priority. Chris, um, he has in his timer, like, or his uh, calendar, like, encourage Jenna in his calendar. So he remembers to do it. I don't care. I love it. You know what I mean? I don't even know what day it's set for, right? So husbands, maybe do that for your wife or wives for your husbands, right? But, um, but do it for your kids, you know? Make... 
Monday or Tuesday, like this is my encouragement day. This is when I fire off to all my kids, spend some time in the spirit. God, what do you want to say to my kids? Right? We had a friend that told us the best form of spiritual warfare with your kids is play, playing, throwing a football around in the backyard. If you have boys, it's like that's connecting with them. Right? We just want to build connection. So if you don't have time to throw a football in the backyard with your son or your grandson, create it. Create it. Like literally go into your calendar, go, I'm going to create some time for my kids and my grandkids. Right? Um, Have you considered taking up an interest in what interests them? Right? It's so easy with technology to just write things off. But come alongside them and go, hey, show me how to do that. Explain that to me. Can I see that video that you're watching? Not to, like, condemn them and convict them. I've done that, too. That doesn't work. Right? But just, like, hey, show me that. Wow, tell me more about that. Just completely to kind of get in their world. Right? It's amazing what you will learn. And if you're discouraged about one of where one of your kids are at, A, get some prayer from somebody. Seek a mentor. Wisdom's found in a multitude of counselors. There's so many men and women in this room that have raised children. And it's like we get that perspective, and it helps us, right? It helps us. So you're not alone. You don't have to only go on YouTube and podcast. Talk to the living testimonies in this place, right? But also, like, grab a book. Listen to a podcast, a biblical-based podcast, FYI. I, I found the issues don't go away if we just ignore them with our kids, right? But they get better dealt with when there's a good bridge there. I really believe it's true that God is bringing accelerate, accelerated growth to our region. And we want to be those who have built their houses on the rock. That when the growth comes, our houses and families don't collapse. We want our lives and families to be vessels that not only carry the growth, but thrive and celebrate when it comes. So that's what I was going to share with you all. (laughs) Wow, that's so good. You guys have questions? Okay. Does anybody else have questions? Nothing? Nothing? How did you ever survive the teenage years? I have a three-nager right now, and I don't know what, and I don't know what to do. Yes. Uh, it's teenage years. This is what I would, for us and you, um, I turned them over to him. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I'm really not kidding, At especially. Age 13. Yeah, yeah, maybe even 12, 12 for the boys. So we have three boys and a girl. Ours are 15 to 20. That's kind of the span of our ages of our kids and our daughter's the youngest, but literally they all respond so much better to him. He describes himself as an immovable force. And he is, I am very like movable. <laughs> I'm fun, but I'm movable. So anyway, anything else you would add? No, I think we actually, we were just explaining this to somebody earlier that those, those that 12, 13, 14 year old age range is a tricky age range because they don't even know who they are, right? They're up and down and they're all around. But around that 16-year-old mark, they actually become so much more clear-minded. And and there's been a a shifting that's starting to happen between between now it's not just father talking down to son, but they become friend. And this is an important transition we've seen over the years. Even when I was doing youth ministry way back in the day, I saw parents that wanted to continue to stay in that authority place and almost control. And what it created was rebellious teenagers. And it blew up their relationship. So I always remember making note, they're going to become my friends. My kids are going to become my friends. So in order to do that, I have to start early with them, build that emotional bridge. But then through these really difficult years of bad decisions that they're making as teenagers, you know, questioning God, all that stuff, I'm going to be a listening ear. I want to be one that's on their speed dial when things go sideways. I want to keep, I want to be the voice of, of, of keeping their design that God gave us early on in front of them. Hey, you may not think this now, but this is what God said over you, and this is what I believe over you. And over through, through those later years, what, what happened is they started to become a friend. And though I'm always their dad, uh, we have a 20-year-old and a, and a 
19-year-old and a 16-year-old, those are the three boys, and they're, they're dear friends of mine. The 16-year-old, we're still working it out. You know, he's still 16. He's 17, whatever he is. Whatever. Birthdays, they just happen. They just happen. But we, we love them. We love, the, we love this season of life uh, right now. So, and I would just say what Jenna was saying is, is that um, we probably all have seen people that have been so Holy Ghost people like, let's go, breathe on me, God. But as soon as the breath of God hits, it just, it's an explosion or an implosion. And unfortunately, or we don't see it immediately, over time though, all of a sudden there's a moral failing, there's one of these things. So I think what Shirley has shared today regarding paying attention to our heart, because right out of the, you know, that's where the springs of life, of keep it with all vigilance, for, for, for from it flow the springs of life. But then also accompanying it with our priorities, taking both of those, that is, I think that's a great solid due north for us um, to take, take out of this conference together. Amen? I would just say if you're a young parent, like it's the 13 to 17 is hard, but it's actually really fun. Like a, lo a lot of you that have graduated kids and they're married and you have grandkids, like there's also just a lot that's fun. As they're becoming adults, you know, uh, our 19-year-old is back at home, and I'm having to hold my mouth so much because I'm like, stop momming him. <laughs> He's don't, uh, you you want to keep the relationship. That's not important. Shut up. You know, I tell this to myself. I'm not telling anybody else. Like, just keep it shut, please. Okay, this, uh, this is a, a dad question. So, like, um, how old is your daughter? She's 15. 15. So, how, how 13? Yeah, 13. <laughs> okay. Okay. I, 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 no, there's So, um, how do you connect with with your uh, your daughter um, and have a, I guess, a solid relationship, yet still being a father, like firm, but sweet at the same time. It it looks like this. So she's the one that I created this narrative about the immovable force, because she's stronger than all three of my boys combined. She's the youngest. And she's got the brown eyes, and she's, she knows she's, she, she wants to, like, own me is what she wants to do, right? <laughs> but I'll just look at her, and I'll smile. I go, you're not changing my mind. I'm your immovable force. And she'll work an angle, work an angle, work an angle, work an angle. I go, you're not moving me, sweetheart. I love you so much. So, she, so I'm consistent. One of the things is I'm consistent. I'm not, I'm not she's like this. Trust me. She is woo, woo, woo. But I am her consistency. And number, number two is I know, her, I know her, um, her leverage point. You know, all of our kids have a leverage point. Sometimes it's money. Sometimes it's a device. Sometimes, you know, sometimes it's a spanking. You know, there's just everyone has a different leverage point. But I know her leverage point, and it's that phone. And, man, that phone has so much power. I'm like, in the name of Jesus, <laughs> you know. And she all of a sudden becomes compliant as compliant could be, right? Here's what I would say is I think in the stuff that we've done for marriages, we always said we're never going to create a parenting book, even that we're answering parenting questions because we're still in the thick of it, you know. And there's no such thing. Parenting just keeps you so humble. You're like, oh, God, have mercy, please. <laughs> what I would say is I try to, like my boys, I try to give them physical affection, smack them on the buns. We wrestle all the time. You know, just it's just, it's man code, right? It's easy. But what she needs, what my daughter needs is a hug. Beyond anything, at 15, it means a ton to her. And so early on, she would, she would come in for hugs. And no matter if I was stressed or if I had a hard day at work, so I established the hugs early. And still, to this point, we're still, it's still working. When, I see, when we see each other, it's a hug. Because a hug communicates that one of, the, one of the most important needs of women, according to statistics, is affection. And the one act of affection that speaks more than any other form of affection, it's a hug, specifically for seven seconds or longer. There's physiology in, involved with it. It's, it communicates to her security. It communicates to her, I'm here for you. I'm, I'm, I'm not going anywhere. I've not changed my mind on you. I love you. So in your, mit in your emotional roller coaster, I still love you in the midst of it. I haven't changed my mind. So those are just a few couple things along the journey, and we're still in the game, so I'll, I'll let you know next year, huh? <laughs> Maybe one more question. No? 
Yeah. We're in the red. We're in the red. Well, we started late, so I took liberties. Uh, one of the things I've learned in uh, survival school when I was in the Navy, um, the code of conduct doesn't apply to terrorists. So what my husband and I say to each other, when we are dealing with tiny children, we do not negotiate with terrorists. <laughs> and you, And please don't take offense to this, but everything that children do is to manipulate parents and find where the boundary is. And like Dr. Chris said, if you are the immovable force, if you are the boundary on both sides, you start to make it narrow and they find where center is. So that's some good word. We appreciate that encouragement for parenting and for life. Um, let's just give them a hand real quick. That was really awesome. Um, yeah. Um, we meet, doors open back here at 6, so you have the rest of the afternoon. I, it's a sunny day on Whidbey Island, if you can believe it. Go explore. Go on a date with your spouse or go hang out with your kids. Go explore the Fort Casey area. Go to Deception Pass Bridge. Just explore. Find something fun to do. Be back here, doors open at six, be ready to engage. I wanna pray for you before I send you out. God, I thank you so much for this morning, this afternoon, um, the sunshine that you've given us. Lord, I pray that every single person in this room that has ears to hear would take seriously the issues of the heart. That we would be willing, open vessels to say, here I am, Lord, take it. Help us to surrender. Don't let us just walk out of here and forget about all these words that we've heard. Lord, let us take a deep breath, realign ourselves so that our compass points back to you. Jesus, we bless your name and we give you the glory. In your name, amen. Amen. We'll see you tonight.